Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's phone call on the Crisis Best Practices Work Group. This is Travis Atkinson with TBD Solutions, and we welcome you. We're excited to have uh, the group here today uh, to focus on our next topic area. So for today's agenda, we will be talking about uh, governance and regulations uh, in crisis programs about some of the different things that uh, the different organizations that people answer to or the accreditation bodies that uh, that are utilized in this level of service. Uh, we're also going to review the survey results and um, uh, the, and have some discussion based on those results related to that uh, content topic area. And then we will review our project plan and timeline going forward uh, for the next few months. Um, if you are having any uh, issues with seeing uh, your slides today, um, or, you know, or if you've only joined us by audio but you're you're not joining us uh, with the, the Skype link, make sure that you use that to be able to follow along on our slides. If you have any questions or any issues that are coming up, uh, email. Claudia, she's our uh, project specialist uh, that's helping us out here going forward. Uh, her email address is claudiav at tbdsolutions.com. Uh, the Crisis Best Practices Workgroup is uh, sponsored by TBD Solutions. We are uh, proud to sponsor the work uh, that we're doing in this workgroup. Uh, we specialize in crisis program development, in metrics development, in middle management training, uh, and a number of other areas, uh, helping providers and payers uh, in their uh, get, getting their healthcare uh, needs met and uh, responding to challenges that they um, are facing in the work that they do. I want to spend a couple minutes just sharing one example of uh, some work that we're doing related to this project, and that is the building of a crisis services map. So a few months ago, uh, I showed you kind of like the first version of this map, um, and I'm going to uh, just bring up a, a web-based version. So this is still in kind of the beta phases. Uh, it hasn't been um, uh, shared publicly yet. Um, but we continue to add information to it. So um, as you're looking at this map here, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide a map of uh, all of the crisis residential, uh, crisis stabilization, psychiatric hospital, um, possibly even mobile crisis teams um, that exist across the country and just be able to identify them. So. Um, as I try to zoom in here, um, I'll show you a couple of what I'm talking about. So we have a few of the crisis stabilization facilities in Colorado uh, listed right here. So as you hover over that box, you can see their name and their, their address and, and what type of facility they are. So right now, the purple boxes that we have are, are crisis stabilization or crisis residential facilities. Uh, the green boxes are uh, the psychiatric hospitals. Um, so just kind of show you another example if we go down here uh, down to San Diego we've got um, we've had really strong participation from our uh, the start programs in San Diego but if we look down here we can kind of see where these different crisis programs are located uh, who operates them <clears throat> and then can also see some of the psychiatric hospitals nearby so we have most of the 375 or so crisis stabilization programs in the country like mapped and we have maybe around a half of the of the psychiatric hospitals um, you can also see down here that we've got these blue dots that represent crisis stabilization units as locked facilities so in some states uh, people say that their crisis stabilization unit is the same as a crisis residential unit in other states but for example in Florida uh, all of their crisis programs are, are locked uh, it's part of the, they're called Baker Act facilities uh, so they don't quite l resemble the, the same types of programs that that uh, that we have been discussing in our work group here so we hope to make this live in the next few months but just kind of wanted to give you a, a little view on what we're trying to do uh, we think that this could really help uh, organizations especially when you're trying to find comparative communities uh, as far as understanding how well resourced they are uh, we have um, some access to like this the CIT database of programs across the country we'd love to get that into our map as well uh, so just 
trying to find some different ways that uh, we can be helpful and, and take information. We even have our, uh, our uh, programs in Alaska and Hawaii um, on our map as well. So give me just a second while I switch back to our presentation. So an update on our workgroup participants. Uh, we at current count have 141 participants, which is awesome. We continue to grow. Uh, we're adding about probably 10 to 15 each month. Uh, we have 98 crisis residential providers. Uh, we have 10 crisis providers, psych hospitals, and peer respites. Uh, and we have uh, four states that are uh, have representatives from their behavioral health or health and human service administrations. So those are Texas, Virginia, Washington, and Wisconsin. Um, we also have representation now from 41 states. We crossed the 40 uh, threshold this past month, which was awesome. Um, and uh, we estimate now that there's about 375 crisis homes uh, across the country. Um, and we also want to welcome our new participants from New England, Massachusetts, South Carolina, and Texas. Uh, so we continue to grow. If you know of, of crisis programs, crisis stabilization, or crisis residential programs um, in your state that uh, would, would benefit from hearing about this information, uh, please feel free to pass along our contact information. Um, also, in the next uh, few months, Claudia and I will be reaching out to try and get a headcount on the crisis programs in each state as well as the psychiatric hospitals in each state. Uh, so just look for that email. We'll just be asking you, we'll give you a list and ask you to verify it um, just to let us know uh, th so that we can try to get that, that count narrowed down um, and, and add to our map as well. So for those of you that are just joining us in the last month or two here, these are all of the different topics that we have covered since we began our, um, uh, our calls and our work group back in December. Uh, so we've, we've covered a lot of areas. We've had some really good discussions about these areas. Uh, last month we talked about the safety net and how crisis programs uh, function uh, and what they're asked to do and when that becomes uh, maybe an ambitious reach or when programs are are expected to um, uh, to take care of other parts of the continuum that they aren't necessarily being reimbursed for uh, and and we got to hear about different programs comfort level with those uh, with those various areas so um, today uh, or this month we're talking about regulations and governments governance, excuse me, not governments, it's not a civics class. Uh, we're talking about regulations and governance and just how programs are monitored uh, both at the state level and uh, at the, the national level as well. So regulations and governments, so we're talking about a few things. We're talking about the standards and guidelines that perhaps your your state has set out for your, uh, for your program. We're talking about maintaining order and we're talking about the kind of more of the compliance side, but but thinking about you know doing the things as I say versus how you do the things. So uh, you know compliance like is your um, is your ther thermometer in your freezer working properly if you're storing food, right? Uh, that's one of your compliance measures. But you know how well do you um, you know engage people in in uh, like daily living skills if that's what they need, or in like the cooking process, or in the, the cleanup process. That might be more of a quality thing about making people feel engaged and, and represented. Um, I couldn't help but put a, a picture of uh, the Warren G album from 1993, uh, Regulate, um, up here. Um, and as I was thinking about this, these regulations, I wondered like what Warren G and Nate Dogg might look like if they were, um, you know, auditors, if they came in to regulate. Um, I also thought about maybe um, together we could write a good like parody song on on regulators, uh, but instead, you know, write it about your licensing auditor or your recipient rights advisor or your state um, uh, work group person, and then we could play that whenever uh, somebody comes in to audit your program just like a good like do 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 you know something like that um i don't know do you think they'd find it fun well maybe we'll put that in as a poll question sometime in the future but uh just <laughs> something to think about um so 
some of the challenges that come along with regulations and government governance in uh, a crisis stabilization program. Uh, the first is about continuous and prescriptive oversight, right? Thinking about uh, the fact that there's someone always looking over your shoulder, um, that they are um, a lot of times feel like they need to um, remind you what you're not doing right. Um, sometimes payers get in this mentality where they want to make sure that they are uh, reminding everyone of their relevance and so they give people a lot of um, uh, you know, and a, a lot of feedback, whether it's warranted or not. Um, there can also be a lot of reactionary policy changes uh, that come along with, um, with with thinking about how these programs uh, have oversight. Uh, and we'll talk. We'll, we'll, we're actually going to um, talk about one of those um, programs uh, a little bit later in, from the survey results. Uh, but uh, you think about many crisis systems. Uh, in our country, especially some of the good ones, have come out of a, a tragedy, right? Have come out of somebody dying, um, a person with a mental illness being sh uh, shot by a police officer, let's say, uh, because of a lack of training or awareness. Uh, and so, like, sometimes these extreme changes can happen, and they might not even relate completely to your program, um, but you still have to comply with them. Another is, is power and expertise differentials, right? Where uh, a, a funder will say it's important that you do this because I'm the funder and we make the rules and you might say we have the expertise in providing this service you know you may have never provided this service before and yet you're telling us what to do or you're telling us how to do it um, and again that com compliance and quality thing can can be challenging a lot of times when programs are under resourced or overwhelmed they just go for compliance right they just make sure they can get through the next licensing audit get through the next CARF audit the next JACO audit um, the next uh, you know state site visit uh, and and just go on to the next thing and so sometimes focusing on those regulations can uh, distract your attention away from trying to provide a, a really quality program as well Okay, so this is the first poll question uh, that we asked. We had 21 respondents this month, and uh, we asked, what rules guide or govern your crisis services? Um, about 62% of the uh, participants said that they have a state Medicaid provider manual that governs crisis services. A uh, little more than half uh, mentioned both state licensing and state contracts. Uh, almost half uh, said that they are accredited in some way uh, through like CAR for Joint Commission or uh, the American Association of Suicidology, uh, and then local payer contracts was kind of the next um, the next one down. And, and a few responded either that uh, they have federal regulations, uh, so they run their program through a, a federal grant, or uh, that they don't have any governance, uh, anyone to answer to. So the next question says, who do you hold contracts with for your crisis services? Um, over half said that they use either Medicaid health plans or community mental health centers uh, to hold those contracts. And one person had a question that responded, but what we mean is just if you're providing the service, uh, who is allowing you to provide the service, right? Um, uh, so about a third of the programs have county entities that are not necessarily a community mental health center. Uh, and then a little under a third hold contracts with commercial health plans, which ties into the webinar that we uh, hosted a few months ago, as well as our discussions around funding sources. And then about 5% have contracts with the Department of Justice or with TRICARE or the Veterans Administration. Um, I believe it's Rosa from Costa Rica uh, had responded and said that they're running their first community mental health center. The Secretary of Mental Health is supporting their efforts and the university is supporting uh, their basic expenses. Um, so kudos to you, Rosa. We're glad that you've been uh, joining our calls and uh, we're excited to see what you guys are doing uh, down there um, in the development of your community mental health uh, services. Okay, so our next question was, who audits your crisis program? And 
85 uh, percent of the respondents said that the state human services division like a health and human services or mental health and addictions department uh, will will do audits will do some sort of site visit maybe on an annual basis or depending on how many years you have to do um, but then there was quite a significant drop in the rest of the survey results only 40 percent said that they uh, have a fire department or fire marshal uh, audit and then 40% said that the commercial health plans uh, complete an audit. About 25% of the community mental health centers do. Only about 10% uh, have a, like a licensing audit. Uh, so a lot of homes uh, in different states kind of get pushed into like one section or another of, um, uh, of you know, of, of, of how their home has to be regulated. And a lot of times in the case of like an adult foster care home, um, we might use the word crisis home, but we, we also know that it's not a long-term residence, and so a, a lot of those rules might not apply, and, and we can definitely uh, cite instances where there's a lot of hoops to jump through for a provider in order to um, uh, meet, meet those requirements. A few additional responses were internal audits, uh, community care licensing, uh, local behavioral health authorities and the state department of healthcare services. Um, just to touch on the first one a little bit, I've heard of organizations that have more than one crisis program that they will periodically audit one another's programs. So maybe it's about documentation, maybe it's about um, you know compliance with things like um, like fire extinguishers or uh, smoke alarms but they will just send one person for like a half day to each other's programs. Uh, and that can kind of give you like a, kind of like a soft audit or a soft review and it can help you to, to kind of keep each other sharp uh, in a way that's not gonna have these big implications. This next slide is about accreditation. Uh, how is your program accredited? 38% uh, of the respondents said that their program is CARF accredited. About 30% said they're not accredited by any outside entity. Uh, Joint Commission was about 14%. Um, and then American Association for Suicidology was 5%. And then none for uh, URAC uh, or uh, NCQA. Uh, however, two others also responded that, the, that they have uh, COA accreditation as well. Okay, so this next slide is about audit discrepancies. And we asked the question, do you experience any discrepancies in audits or site reviews from one auditor to the next? And only 30% of the respondents said that they do experience uh, discrepancies, which is good. It means there's there's good consistency and you're not being kind of pulled around in, in, in one direction or the next. Um, but a couple of the comments that came in, one was that the state recommends a hard lock on the facility, yet our local fire department will not approve that. So we have had to apply for special waivers from the state to have a 30 second egress lock. Um, I wonder, I want to throw a question out to the group. Are there any um, other programs that have had um, kind of like conflicting responses between one entity and another, especially if it's like fire department and uh, licensing or licensing and police or like any of those groups that have kind of um, where you have like competing priorities or two people to answer to and it's been hard to find the right the right way to go um, I don't know if this is what you're looking for but I know we have run into situations where our Department of Mental Health and our Department of Medicaid have conflicting goals and that can be somewhat difficult at times. Okay, and how have you tried to uh, address that? We really haven't found a resolution yet. Okay, all right, thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, we are going to go on to the contract requirements. So, if you make, maintain a contract with your funders, what requirements does the contract include? 85% um, of the respondents said staffing makeup. Um, almost all of the, th really every, every part that we asked about said that 
had more than a 50% response, whether it's documentation to support billing, training, structure measures, process measures, uh, those kinds of things. This, the, the smallest was outcome measures, and I think we've been talking about that a little bit uh, in our group here as well, uh, but that, um, that we... Um, we, we're going to see a rise in that in, in crisis services and really in behavioral health services in general is when people start to ask more about like the outcomes um, and, and, uh, and, and ask what kind of influence and effect your services are having on people, not just in the immediate short term, but also in the long term. Okay, our next question says, if you are contractually obligated to achieve performance metric standards, what are the consequences of not meeting those standards? 60% uh, of the respondents said loss of funding or returning payments to a funder. Uh, Reprocurement uh, of contract and loss of contract came in at about 47%. Um, it was interesting, 13% of the respondents said that there are no consequences. Um, I'm wondering if any of those programs are on the line and would be willing to just talk about like what what that experience has been like when uh, you're told that you have these expectations, you or a, another a provider around you doesn't meet them, and then nothing happens. Okay, sounds like we don't have anyone on the call that uh, has that experience, which is cool. That's okay. Uh, the next question is, are there any incentives to achieving performance metric standards? Uh, about a third said yes. Um, a lot of people said continued funding or continued existence. Uh, one person said increased revenue. Um, the next question that we had was about uh, performance standards and consequences. So asking, is your crisis program under a competitive bidding process for any of your current contracts? And I thought this was really interesting. Only 20% of the respondents said that they are under a procurement process. Uh, in Michigan, uh, all of the programs are, are procured at some frequency. I believe it's around five to seven years. Uh, uh, Dan uh, from the start programs in, in San Diego said that that they were just reprocured by the county for the first time in 37 years and they'll now be on a five-year reprocurement schedule uh, like all other county contracts and the, the VA also reprocured their, their contract for the first time uh, so that um, that can that can have huge influence and depending on how your funder feels about you at the time, um, sometimes it can also feel like not a very objective process. Uh, we've certainly in, in the state of Michigan seen uh, programs uh, reprocured to different organizations um, and so that can feel a little bit unnerving. Uh, so if you are a program that doesn't have to reprocure, and especially it doesn't work in a fee-for-service model, um, consider yourself lucky because there's a lot of programs across the country uh, that have both of those stressors kind of weighing on them as they provide those services, thinking about how do we keep this sustainable and make sure that um, that we're being responsive to uh, you know our funders' needs and, and keeping these contracts, and then also how do we keep our beds full uh, you know, immediately, how do we make sure that we're keeping our utilization rate at, you know, 85 or 90 percent or more, uh, keeping our beds full? So um, I actually wanted to, to turn it over for a minute to uh, Lindsay McGarry, who is the director of outpatient services at Hope Network Behavioral Health. And uh, she's going to talk for a minute about uh, her experiences in trying to navigate some of these challenges uh, with licensing and trying to meet the needs uh, of some of the people that that uh, that they're serving in their crisis programs. So, uh, Lindsay, are you on the call with us? Okay, maybe not. Um, or I'm if sorry, you are, Lindsay, here, you might Travis. be muted. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Oh. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you can hear me. So yeah, Lindsay McGarry with Hope Network. <clears throat> so at 
hope is we provided crisis residential services over the years. We found, like I'm sure all of you have, that a huge number of the people we serve who are experiencing a mental health crisis also have a co-occurring substance use concern going on in their lives. For this reason, we're definitely making sure that our programs are co-occurring competent and that our teams have the skills to address both acute mental health and addiction-related barriers in the lives of the people we serve. But we face a barrier in our systems of care when the addiction needs that somebody presents with escalate to the point of them needing detox services <clears throat> in addition to their mental health treatment. There are people who are in the right level of care for crisis resi residential services versus inpatient level of care, but they still have, they do have a need because they've been drinking alcohol or using other drugs so that's leading them to be at risk of dangerous withdrawal symptoms. And so they also need detox in, in addition to their crisis residential services for mental health. So um, in Michigan, our licensing is pretty explicit in saying that we can't serve somebody with a primary mental health and a primary or a primary substance use in the same location. And the licensing rules are very specific about the types of services you need available in the program to serve people who need active detox services. It can't happen in an adult foster care home, which is how we're licensed in Michigan for crisis residential programs. <clears throat> and so what can happen is people either get bounced back and forth. So a great example is somebody's had a recent suicide attempt or they're having thoughts about suicide, so they need acute mental health treatment and they can be safe in a residential setting, so they're referred to crisis residential, but they have a kind of dangerous withdrawal risk. And so um, we would want to refer them to a detox program, but at the detox program, their mental health needs are too acute, and so there's kind of a bouncing back and forth that happens there, and ultimately people end up inpatient when they don't need that lockdown, um, no shoelaces type of treatment and inpatient um, that, that they provide. And so we've been doing advocacy over the last couple of years with the state to say we would love to be able to do both crisis residential and detox services in the same place, and we know other states um, do allow for that and other crisis residential programs across the country do have beds reserved for detox because of this need that we all find that people um, often are experiencing needs in both areas. <clears throat> um, we've started with our local and regional licensing body. LARA is our licensing body here in Michigan and we've started locally and um, we have lobbyists who have brought to the forefront but we haven't really connected with the right people to date and so um, a couple months ago, we had a meeting with some leaders for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services who were open to discussing this further and talking with LARA, the licensing body. And so at this point, we're waiting to hear back from the director of the statewide licensing body that um, licenses adult foster care homes and hoping the next step would be to get the MDHHS people, um, so those are the people who oversee the Medicaid. Um, dollars being spent on the crisis services with LARA, the licensing body, to talk together about what this need looks like in our state and hopefully come up with some creative solutions for creating a new type of license for this type of program or um, allowing some exceptions for adult foster care homes to be able to provide this type of service. So that's kind of an overview of um, where, where we're at with that need. Thank you, Lindsay. That's really helpful to hear. And um, it, it sounds like you guys are just trying to take a like a modern approach to meeting the needs of people, and you're you're using you're trying to address or overcome issues that are um, uh, like last century. Maybe I guess is the best way to describe it. When you've got these regulations, and and people used to think that you know you only had a substance use issue or a um, a, a mental health issue, and so um, it sounds like it can be quite a challenge to kind of like fight that uphill battle and uh, try to integrate these two populations and but provide services in a way that you feel is meaningful and, and the most helpful. Absolutely. Yep. And, and I'm optimistic we're going to get there because I think the whole system is moving in the direction we want it to go anyway. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, that insight. So. Moving on, uh, th th so those were our slides for, for governance and, 
and regulations today, but I just wanted to take a, a quick minute and talk a little bit about survey participation up to this point. Uh, so we have, if, uh, the slide in front of you kind of shows what our participation has looked like uh, since we started our group. Um, and some of these slides, uh, you don't have to, um, uh, the, the, the surveys don't have to be filled out um, sequentially. Right, so sometimes we've asked people to, to fill out certain um, survey responses, such as the ones in March that, that were centered around uh, the taxonomy, like how we refer to programs, um, and, and, and some of the earlier ones as well. But if you remember the slide that I showed uh, right near the start of our call today, uh, we've had about, uh, we're close to 100 crisis stabilization providers of that 141 that are participating. Um, so from that perspective, we've had uh, a, our max has been about 35 or 40 percent participation. Um, there's been a few months, obviously, where we've had closer to 20 percent, and that would include this past month. Um, so and really, our average participation over over that course has been 25 percent. Uh, we the the our entire project really is precipitated on uh, this kind of crowdsourcing model and thinking about like how do we get everyone's input into this toolkit. Uh, so we are uh, some some toolkits when they're developed they use like expert content knowledge to 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 uh, inform what they're doing. We're kind of taking this approach of of treating everyone like an expert and, and taking all uh, perspectives in uh, and, and, and kind of getting a good diverse and broad viewpoint. Uh, but that really means that our whole project precipitates on participation. Um, so we'd really like to see these numbers closer to somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of our of our providers. And so um, we're going to st like start to um, implement some incentives for participation. Uh, it's also how we're able to keep this group, uh, this, this whole project, uh, free of cost. Uh, so some work groups like ours will either charge for their um, the participation or for the toolkit. And we're, we're not charging for either one of those. We want this to be kind of a free source model. Uh, but again, we really need your help. We recognize that I'm probably preaching to the choir here if we've got people who are involved in the phone call that there, there's probably a good chance uh, that you're also completing your surveys. And if you are, that's really helpful. Um, but and this is really focused on the providers. Um, we've had some uh, like state administrators that have filled out our surveys, and that's great. Keep doing that, especially if you have a like a, a working knowledge of, of the crisis services in your state. Uh, but this is really focused on the crisis stabilization, crisis residential providers, that we really need that participation to kind of keep our group going and to keep our information strong so that we can make affirmative and, and um, well-informed statements uh, when we are, are building our toolkit. So from that perspective, there's a couple incentives we want you to be aware of. The first is that crisis providers who are completing 80% of our surveys are going to get early access to our best practices toolkit. Right now, we estimate that the toolkit is going to be available in early 2018, probably February or March of 2018. Um, and we will be making that uh, uh, the toolkit available uh, somewhere between 30 and 90 days early to providers who have given us that high level of participation. Uh, the other piece that we want to let you know is that participants who are contributing significantly uh, through these surveys will also be recognized as contributors uh, in our toolkit. Uh, you know, this is a way to say thank you and a way to, to recognize that this is not a uh, a, a, a one horse show I guess that like everybody is has that, that, that participates at this level uh, is, is a substantial contributor and we want to recognize and honor that um, so if so in the next um, six weeks or so, uh, Claudia and I are going to be working on uh, getting those requests out about the missing surveys. Uh, we, we don't want you to get survey fatigue and we recognize that. There's a handful of our surveys that have, you know, they, they've averaged up to like 10 minutes to complete, but most of them I think are about five minute surveys. Um, if that's this information that you have in your head, but so does someone else in your organization, by all means, feel free to send them um, uh, to, to, to do the surveys and we'll, we'll send you links to the ones that are missing. Um, if you want to get a jump on it and you're curious what surveys are missing, uh, please let us, uh, please feel free to email us and then we can, we can get those right out to you. Um, but our goal is to have those done 
if, if we're getting to everyone by the end of September, then by the end of October we would have all that information. And that's going to allow us probably sometime in November or December uh, to start really putting together the toolkit, taking all the information that we have and, and putting it into uh, uh, you know, a, a comprehensive document. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to email Claudia. Uh, her email address is up on the screen here. It's ClaudiaV at TBDSolutions.com. Um, we really do appreciate everyone that has participated. Um, but again, we want to make sure that our, that our participant numbers are at kind of like a meaningful threshold, uh, considering that we've got about 375 programs in the country. We've got 140 participants, and, and in, that includes 100 of the programs, um, we're hoping to get, uh, like I said, more like a 50%, maybe 75% even uh, participation rate with, with some of our surveys. That being said, uh, our one of our last big announcements, and, and I'm going to apologize here because I was confused, um, if you can imagine, but there are actually two webinars on the same day of the month, the, the fourth fun day, fourth fun day Fun Monday, it's probably a fun day, I guess, if there's two webinars, but the fourth Monday of each month from April through September, um, uh, SAMHSA is hosting uh, two, two tracks of, of webinars. One is called Communities Addressing Trauma and Strife Through Trauma-Informed Approaches. The other is Trauma-Informed Innovation in Crisis Services. Uh, so there are little links on the bottom uh, to both of those. Um, and the descriptions for the the program the the next webinars that are coming up are listed on the right side of the screen. Uh, you can check out SAMHSA's website as well if you're curious about uh, registering for those. But uh, some really rich information in those um, in those webinars it's been really uh, good, and I think especially the second one uh, can be very applicable to uh, to your services. Our next conference call is scheduled for Friday, September 15th at 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we are still looking for probably one or two more topics uh, before we kind of finish up our conversations about uh, what's going to be included in our toolkit. So if you have questions or ideas about uh, what to cover, uh, maybe there's a topic area that we haven't really dove into that you think would be helpful, uh, please feel free to, to send me an email. Uh, and, and let me know what you think about that. Um, and then we'll have likely uh, another work group on Wednesday, October 25th at 2 p.m. So you will receive uh, meeting invites for those probably within the next week. Uh, we've seen people using the listserv uh, a lot in the last month and especially this week. It's been great to see the conversations going on about uh, the uh, alumni groups and, and, and people that are trying to engage those. Uh, if you want, feel free to, to send an email directly to the listserv. It uh, goes to crisisresidentialnetwork at tbdsolutions.com. You don't have to send it to me first. Uh, you can just you can send it right there. It gets filtered and then sent out. And if you want to uh, see recordings of our past webinars or the meeting slides, you can find those at crisisresidentialnetwork.com. Um, if I, I didn't get any questions prior to the beginning of our uh, phone call, so I, I'm guessing that we don't have any other, other areas, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly at TravisA at TBDSolutions.com. And lastly, all of our uh, calls, uh, the, the video recordings of our calls are hosted uh, on our TBD Solutions YouTube page. So that is it for today. Thank you so much for everyone that joined us, and we will talk again next month.